And it started out quite a long time ago, in the early 1950s. I came directly from the law school and entered the FBI. I became a special agent of the FBI. And during those years, you recall, it was a period where there was only two great political powers in the world, the Soviet Union and the United States, communism versus capitalism, for four decades. And my job was to interview communists. And as I would talk to these men and women, many of them were very intelligent, they would say communism is the best way of life. This is how we're all going to be living. It is much more equitable, less economic diversity. We will all be living like that. And of course, I did not agree. But prior to 1952, the Soviet Union never had an Olympic team. But in the early 1950s, they embarked upon a governmental sports program trying to make a statement on the international stage on the friendly field of sports competition with respect to the superiority of a system, a way of life. And they were recruiting young men and women the best they could to train them in the Olympic sports especially. And throughout the 50s, they continued that training program. At the end of that decade in 1959, for the first time, the Soviet Union elected to compete against the United States head-to-head, -head, nation to nation, in track and field in Philadelphia. Now, at that time, I was living in Columbus, Ohio, was then out of the FBI, and I knew that they intended to win, and they knew they would win. So I went down to Philadelphia, and on that weekend in Franklin Field, where the United States men's team, which had athletes who had been trained at the college level and high school level, having all these tremendous competitive opportunities, managed to beat the Soviet men's track team, even though they'd been training professionally for a decade. But on the same field, on the same day, the women athletes were competing. And in the high jump, the young lady representing the United States in international competition in the high jump was doing what you call the scissors high jump. And that means you're just coming up and sort of stepping over the bar like you do in high school. And the Russian girl athlete was doing what was then known as the Western roll and jumping a full foot higher than the U.S. girl. And in every one of the events, the result was the same. The fact of the matter was, the girls had not had an opportunity to be trained or an opportunity to compete at the high level. And as a consequence, that Monday morning in the Philadelphia Enquirer, the headline that goes out across the world was, Soviet team beats US. And the reason was, of course, they combined men's and women's team scores and the women had not been able to perform and consequently the diversity was too high and we as a team lost the competition. So I'm coming back from Philadelphia and I'm saying this just isn't right. People don't understand what's happening here politically on the world stage. The Soviets are beating us. And I said, I could find a girl in Worthington, Ohio, where I lived, who could, I could show her how to do the high jump, and she could jump higher almost immediately than that girl who was representing us in the United States. So I went to the coach of the Worthington High School track team, a man named Les Eisenhower. I said, can you identify for me a 14, 15 year old girl who's the best girl athlete in Worthington? He said, I think I can. And he came back and he said, I found a girl who at 14 is beating the boys at 14. She's really great, but she's not being given a chance to do anything. And he gave her her name. Her name was Melissa Long. 
And I contacted Melissa and her mother. And I said, I want to start a little Olympic development project here. Melissa, you're a great young athlete. And uh, we want to start training you a little bit in track. And Melissa was in heaven because nobody was giving her a chance to compete, to do anything. And here's somebody talking about giving her a chance to do what she wanted to do. So we got her a pair of track shoes, trained her for a few weeks, and then they held a huge junior Olympic competition at Ohio State University. Columbus Recreation Department is running it. 1,500 youngsters from Central Ohio in the early teenage group. And I said, Melissa, we're gonna go down and you'll compete. Melissa went down there. There were 700 girls, early teenage girls in that group, 800 boys. Melissa won both dashes, so she's very fast. But I saw at the same time that there were other girls there running almost as fast as she was, some of them jumping pretty high, some of them throwing very far. And I thought, wait a minute, maybe we have a team uh, potential here. So the following Monday morning, I went to the Columbus Recreation Department and introduced myself to Mr. Nick Barrick. There's a bill building named after him now. But he had been president of the National Amateur Athletic Union, in addition to being recreation director. He had been in Philadelphia, and he saw what happened. And I said, I would like the application blanks for these dozen girls who performed so well at Ohio State University this weekend. He said, good, see what you can do. So he gave me the application blanks and I contacted each one of those dozen girls and their families. And they came from all over Central Ohio. None of them had known each other before. They were just from all over the recreation department areas. And the reaction in every case was the same. They were all little girls who just wanted to run, wanted to compete but weren't being given a chance, you know. So I told them, we're gonna form a team. And so, man, what do you do with them? I've got a dozen top flight young women for the Ohio Track Club girls team. So I went to Ohio State University and I talked to Larry Snyder, who had been the coach of Jesse Owens and was still the coach of track and field at Ohio State. He had been in Philadelphia and had seen what happened. I told him I've identified the top dozen young teenage girls here in Columbus and I'm going to form a track team and I want to train them and I would like to use the indoor facilities at French Fieldhouse in order to train these girls. I would train them after your men's team had been done competing in the afternoon. And he said, well, if you will get approval of Dick Larkins, who was the athletic director, he said, it's okay with me. And so I talked with Dick Larkins, and Dick Larkins liked the idea, and so we began training those dozen girls every evening after school during that winter there. So you've got a high flight team of girls, what do you do then? Well, where do you got to have them compete someplace? So in the uh, winter, first January, February, and March of 1960, the indoor track season starts. And competitions are in the Milrose Games at Madison Square Garden, in Chicago, in Buffalo, in Washington, D.C., in Louisville, Cleveland. Every weekend, we began taking a relay team to the indoor track events in the indoor season. And these girls were winning. The following summer, June of 1960, were the Olympic trials for track and field in Corpus Christi, Texas. I was working for Nationwide Insurance at that time, and our team had been getting some good recognition for their championship indoor season. And Nationwide gave me their corporate plane to take the team to Corpus Christi, Texas for the Olympic trials. So I arrive in Corpus Christi, Texas with this 
well-uniformed, highly performing team on a jet. And the next thing I know, I'm secretary of the United States Olympic Committee for women's track and field. And so that's a new area of challenge because I got some challenge at the national level on this. And then I continue to have these girls compete. But then in the year 1961, I was selected to take this year's United States team into the Soviet Union. So I took the, in 1961, took the United States team into the Soviet Union and had Wilma Rudolph, one of my team members, in two. But then in 1962, I ran the National Indoor Track and Field Championships for Women at French Fieldhouse at Ohio State University. And that Ohio Track Club girls team won the National Indoor Track and Field Championships. The following summer, I ran the National Outdoor Championships in track and field here in Central Ohio. And as a result of those running those national championships, why, as we moved through the 60s, and then in 1964, I was made chairman of the United States Olympic Committee for Women's Track and Field. So in 1967, near the end of my chairmanship there, the Amateur Athletic Union knew that I'd had experience running national championships. They knew that I loved uh, weightlifting and the sport of bodybuilding. And they said, if we can get the national championships in weightlifting here in Columbus, Ohio at Veterans Memorial, uh, would you run the national weightlifting championships? And I said that I would. Those championships were run very successfully. We sold out Veterans Memorial. And the National AAU Weightlifting Committee then came to us and said, we think we can get the World Weightlifting Championships here in the United States. They've not been here before. But if we can get the World Weightlifting Championships in the United States in 1970, will you host them at Veterans Memorial? And I said that we would. So we were awarded those championships and I contacted ABC TV Wide World of Sports in New York and told them we're going to have the World Weightlifting Championships and a Mr. World Contest in Columbus, Ohio in September of 70. And we would like you to televise this sport for the first time. And they agreed that they would. So with that challenge and that opportunity to have TV, I then contacted the top six bodybuilders in the world, one of whom was a young Austrian I found working out in the gymnasium in Gold's Gym in California. I got him on the phone and I said, Arnold, I'm going to have a World Weightlifting Championships and Mr. World Contest in Columbus. I have ABC TV, Wild World of Sports going to tell us. I said, I would like you to compete. And he said, I really want to talk to you about this, but I'm in the middle of my workout. Would you call me back? And so I did. I called him back and he said, the date that you give me in September on a Sunday, unfortunately, the evening before that, I must be in London, England for a Mr. Universe contest. I've already made the commitment. I must make it. And I don't think I'll be able to do it. And I said, well, if you compete uh, Saturday evening in London, take the last flight out of Heathrow, you'll pick up the six hours coming here. We will meet you by plane in New York and get you to Columbus on Sunday. And he said, if you will do that, I will do that. So he came in and competed, and he won. And Veterans Memorial was packed. And afterwards he came up to me and he said, this is the best event I have ever been in. When I am done competing in the sport, he said, Right now, I'm making the most a $1,000 a year. He said, I want to professionalize this sport, make it possible for men to make a living out of it, and I'm going to come back to Columbus, Ohio, and ask you to be my partner. And I said, uh, yeah, because I did not know that throughout his lifetime, he's been a man who's always working in his personal planning five years out. So for the next five years, he won everything. And his last event was in South Africa in 1975. At the same time, they made the movie Pumping Iron. Uh, 
And he stopped on the way back from South Africa and called me and said, I'd like to talk with you. And we met at the Holiday Inn downtown. And he said, as I told you five years ago, I want to go into the promotion of the sport. I'm retiring. He said, I am still making just $1,000 for winning a world competition. The first year we will give 10,000 and in three years we will give 100,000. And I will help get the sponsors for this event. I will help get the athletes here. You run the competition. And we shook hands. And since that day in 75, our partnership has continued on a handshake. And for those first years there, why we ran major bodybuilding competitions. And we met all of the economic goals that we did. Have. But we kept running Mr. Olympia contests, Mr. Universes. But in 1989, Arnold was made chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. And I was on that council with him. And at the time, we were traveling around the country, we found that other sports, like martial arts, like gymnastics, knew that we were running a fair size event a bodybuilding event here in Columbus, Ohio. And they said, could we have our sport uh, join in and be a part of your event in some way, be part of the Arnold Weekend? Because we know you're drawing a good crowd and we'd like them to be exposed to our sport. So in that year, we began to expand. And for every year since then, we have had other sports coming to us. So the graduation, gradual growth has been since that 1890 period, every year adding two and three new sports, always focusing very much on the Olympic sports, on the thing, internationalizing it. But the growth has just been gradual and the Columbus community response to it has been tremendous because they have supported us right from the beginning and the community's growth with the, something like the Creator Columbus Convention Center has enabled us to make a quantum leap where we again immediately pick up a million five hundred thousand square feet to, to compete on and that gives you uh, the ability and similarly when Veterans Memorial later comes down where they opened up the High Expo Center for another million five hundred thousand square feet and so we have been able to fill all of those three million square feet bringing now into this community every year over $51 million and representatives from 80 nations. And also these representatives from 80 nations are coming and making this, liking this experience. And they're saying to us, could we have an Arnold's Sports Festival in Spain? And so Arnold said, let us see if we can get an Arnold Sports Festival on each continent. And so the first one was in Madrid, and that was going to be on Europe. And that was six years ago that we started. We've been in Madrid for six years, and then we go to Australia, we go to Brazil, and then here in 2016, we're going to be on all six continents, which includes Johannesburg, South Africa, and Hong Kong, China. And we have major, major scope events in each one of those cases. Each one of those events, the sports festivals in those countries, are themselves really numerically almost Olympic scope. In other words, they are having as many as 10,000 athletes in 30 different sports in almost all those countries. The reason we have had double that is we've had many, many more years of building. But they are all thriving, all doing very well with the same model, the model that was created here in Columbus, Ohio but which was instigated and started because of an Olympic development effort for girls.